Namaste, friends, disciples, and devotees. I had promised you I would speak on Mother and Sri Aurobindo on Animals, part two. And here we are today on the 30th of January, 2021. From the Mother. It is man's mental consciousness that has filled all nature with the idea of sin and all the misery which it brings. Animals are not unhappy in the way we are, not at all, not at all, except as Sri Aurobindo says, those that have been corrupted. The corrupted ones are those that live with men. Dogs have the sense of sin and guilt. It is because their whole aspiration is to become like man. Man is God. And then dissimulation, falsehood. Dogs do lie. Men admire that. They say, oh, how intelligent they are. They have lost their divinity. The human species in the spiral ascent is truly at a point which is not pretty. But isn't a dog more conscious than a tiger, more evolved and higher in the spiritual, that is to say, nearer to the divine? To be conscious is not the point. Man is more evolved than the tiger. There is not the shadow of a doubt. But the tiger is more divine than man. You must not confuse things. The two things are quite different. You see, the divine is everywhere, in everything. You should never forget that. Not for a second should you forget it. He is everywhere, in everything, and unconsciously, but spontaneously, and therefore, sincerely, everything that is below the mental manifestation is divine without mixture. That is to say, spontaneously, by its very nature. It is man with his mind who has introduced the idea of guilt. Naturally, he is much more conscious. That is not to be disputed. It is well understood. Because what we call consciousness, what we call, that is to say, what man calls consciousness, is the power to objectify and mentalize things. It is not the true consciousness, but it is what men call consciousness. So in this human way, it is understood that man is much more conscious than the animal. But with man comes sin and perversion, which do not exist outside the state we call conscious, but which is not truly conscious, which simply consists in mentalizing things, in having the capacity to objectify them. It is a curve of ascent, but that curve moves away from the divine, and one must rise much higher to find again, naturally, a higher divine, for it is a conscious divine. Whereas the others are divine without being conscious, spontaneously and instinctively. And our whole moral notion of good and bad, we have thrown all that upon the creation with our deformed and perverted consciousness. It is we who have invented it. We are the deforming intermediary between the purity of the animal 
and the divine purity of the gods? Then this question is asked to the mother. What kind of love do animals have for men? Mother replies, it is almost the same as that of rather unintellectual men for the divine. It is made of admiration, trust, and a sense of security, admiration. It seems to you something really very beautiful, and it is not reasoned out, an admiration from the heart, so to speak, spontaneous. For instance, dogs have this in a very high degree, and then trust. Naturally, this is sometimes mixed with other things with the feeling of some need and dependence. For it is that person who will give me to eat when I am hungry, give me shelter when it is rough weather, who will look after me. This is not the most beautiful side. And then, unfortunately, it gets mixed up. And I believe I consider it entirely man's fault, with a kind of fear a feeling of dependence and a kind of fear of something which is much stronger, much more conscious, much more uh, which can harm you and you have no strength to defend yourself. It is a pity, but I believe it is altogether man's fault. But if men really deserved the love of animals, it would be made of a feeling of wonder and of the sense of security. It is something very fine, this sense of security, something that's able to protect you, to give you all that you need, and near which you can always find shelter. Animals have an altogether rudimentary mind. They are not tormented by incessant thoughts like human beings. For example, they feel a spontaneous gratitude for an act of kindness towards them, whilst men, 98 times out of 100, begin to reason and ask themselves what interest one could have in being good. This is one of the great miseries of mental activity. Animals are free from this, and when you are kind to them, they are grateful to you spontaneously. And they have trust, so their love is made of that, and it turns into a very strong attachment, an irresistible need to be near you. There is something else. If the master is really a good one, and the animal faithful, there is an exchange of psychic and vital forces, an exchange which becomes for the animal something wonderful, giving it an intense joy. When they like to be quite close to you in that way, when you hold them, it is that they vibrate internally. The force one gives them, the strength of affection, of tenderness, protection, all that, they feel it, and it creates a deep attachment in them. Even fairly easily, in some of the higher animals, like dogs, elephants, and even horses, it creates quite a remarkable need for devotion, which indeed is not thwarted by all the reasonings and arguments of the mind, which is spontaneous and very pure in its essence, something that's very beautiful. Then this question is asked to the mother. There are animals with very developed senses, aren't there? Mother replies, ah, yes, there are animals which are much more advanced than we. Animals have much more perfect senses than those of men. I challenge you to track a man as a dog does, for instance. 
This means that in the curve, or rather the spiral of evolution, animals, and more so those we call higher animals, because they resemble us more closely, are governed by the spirit of the species, which is a highly conscious consciousness. Bees, ants, obey this spirit of the species, which is of quite a special quality. And what is called instinct in animals is simply obedience to the spirit of the species, which always knows what ought and ought not to be done. There are so many examples you know. You put a cow in a meadow. It roams around, sniffs, and suddenly puts out its tongue and snatches a blade of grass. Then it wanders about again, sniffs, and gets another tuft of grass. And so it goes on. Has anyone ever known a cow under these conditions to eat poisonous grass? But shut this poor animal up in a cow shed, gather and put some grass before it, and the poor creature, which has lost its instinct because it now obeys man, excuse me, eats the poisonous grass along with the rest of it. We have already had three such cases here, three cows which died from having eaten poisonous grass. And these unfortunate animals, like all animals, have a kind of respect, which I could call unjustifiable, for the, for the superiority of man. If he puts poisonous grass before the cow and tells it to eat, it eats it. But left to itself, that is, without anything interfering between it and the spirit of the species, it would never do so. All animals which live close to man lose their instinct because they have a kind of admiration, full of devotion for this being who can give them shelter and food without the least difficulty, and a little fear too, for they know that if they don't do what man wants, they will be beaten. It is quite strange. They lose their ability. Dogs, for instance, the sheepdog, which lives far away from men with the flocks and has a very independent nature. It comes home from time to time and knows its master well, but often does not see him. If it is bitten by a snake, it will remain in a corner, lick itself, and do all that is necessary till it gets cured. The same dog, if it stays with you and is bitten by a snake, dies quietly, like man. So very interesting. Namaste to all.